it's Steve Zaki once again. I'm in Indianapolis. Month of May, Indianapolis 500 coming up. I'm at uh, Duman's uh, Turn 4 Restorations at a get-together. Ran into my buddy here, Denny Miller. Uh, some of you may know Denny Miller. He's uh, quite the historian. Wrote a book on Eddie Sachs. And I said, Denny, we got to talk about Eddie Sachs. I haven't seen anything really decent on YouTube uh, on Eddie Sachs, you know. And, uh, and sadly for some, you know, unfortunately, Eddie's just a guy, you know, he's that guy, yeah, he loved Indy, and he got killed in the 64 race, but mm -hmm. there's a lot more there, isn't there? Oh, yeah, and uh, I bet this is going to be the most sensational yeah. uh, interview you've ever done. We'll tell a few of his zany stories and everything. And, uh, but, I mean, he was a guy who, uh, you know, came up through the rough and tumble sprint car ranks, mm -hmm. and, but... He wasn't a natural born racer, was he? Absolutely not. In fact, he, he the case could be made, he might have been probably one of the worst race car drivers ever to have driven a car. He certainly didn't know anything about uh, how a car was set up. Some people used to say they could put a right front on the left rear and he wouldn't know the difference, but he had the ability to drive it. And he was so bad when he first started out, but he would tell all the car owners, he was the greatest driver. Yeah. Uh, we got a screenplay about him coming out on the opening scenes as he goes into uh, Blair Ratliff's uh, uh, trailer at Dayton, and he burst in there. Ratliff used to have a drinking issue, and he was kind of falling asleep at the desk, and uh, Sachs wakes him up, and he's startled, and you know, Eddie says... I'm Eddie Sachs, the world's greatest race car driver, and I want to know how much you will pay me to appear on your season's opener. And the Rattler says, never heard of you. Now get the hell out. And he says, no, uh, I'm the best, and I'll help you get a great crowd. He says, all right, I'll tell you what. If you can put on a better show than the 24 very good race car drivers that we are having up here, I'll give you anything you want, but if you can't get the hell out of here and never come back, <laughs> so sax and he struts out and everything, and uh, and eventually, a couple three years later, Blair was actually begging him to, to come and appear and everything, and that was the same weekend that uh, Gordon Reed, who was the double for. Uh, Frank Sinatra and Anchors Away uh, gets decapitated at the Dayton, and three others also got killed in that accident that day. That was a rough accident. Yeah. Uh, you know, Eddie Sachs, you know, missed out a couple, of, as was almost the norm back then. First time you went to Indianapolis, you didn't necessarily just went there and made the race. It took you a couple times after you get into the race, and now mm -hmm. certainly the case with uh, Eddie, and then he got into the Peter Schmidt car, and then he. he, he Oh, boom. First now, how that first started was in 1953, uh, Russ Clendenin did sign his his um, paperwork. He needed to have his own supervisor to do that. So he was getting better. Uh, and he comes to Indianapolis. And there's a funny story attached to it. And this helps add to the legacy of why they called him the Clown Prince. But he was at the White Front which was a popular bar and hangout place for all the racers the night before, and he was joined by Pat O'Connor. And both Pat and uh, uh, Eddie were going to take their rookies test the next day. Uh, so they're sitting, oh, then Eddie's mom comes in, and she looked a lot like Ann Miller, the actress. Okay. Uh, a real attractive woman, and she was with Doc Morris. And Doc made his uh, fame doing operations that were not necessarily legal. Ah. Uh, and uh, so he owned a tired race car, the more special, and Eddie was going to take his driver's test on that. They first tried that. Uh, Wilbur Shaw was a no-nonsense kind of a guy, and Eddie was trying to clown around with, uh, with Wilbur and... Whereas O'Connor was calling him Mr. Shaw, Eddie was calling him Wilbur, and, uh, and it was really getting under Wilbur's skin. Peel out Wilbur and all sorts of stuff. And in, in Sachs' mind, that was a goal, that he was going to be friends with Wilbur, and Wilbur did not like 
you know, clowning around that Sachs was doing. But they let him take the test. Uh, at the white front, I was going to say that he met these four very attractive girls, and he brings them over. And he'd do things like, uh, like, uh, Pat, uh, this is your lucky day. This is Doc Morris. Do you know him? And he says, no, uh, but, but by reputation. And he says, uh, but it is, you're real good. By, by the way, are you circumcised, Pat? Uh, because Doc's running a special on that. And it just embarrasses him and, and uh, the mother, uh, who Eddie would only call Evelyn, uh, was there. So Sax gets up and he sees these four very attractive girls come into the white front. And he goes over there and persuades all four of them to join that third table. O'Connor's thinking, boy, he's gonna, his alimony is going to be just out of sight if he hangs around the sacks. <laughs> so uh, soon after, uh, Sachs just gives them the line of you know, just how good he is and everything. And it was overwhelming. Yeah. They, uh, but it, it then suddenly became contagious. So he tells Pat, he says, you know, you're, you can stay out drinking and carousing the rest of the night. I'm going to go home and go to bed with these four girls. So And they follow him out like the Pied Piper. So the next day, uh, they show up to see him take his rookies test. And he tells them the best place is to go down and watch them go through turn three and everything. He said, I'll even wave at you. So... Uh, he goes out there and they, and he takes the first lap and at speed now. And of course, back then they they had mm -hmm. various phases, so he couldn't go over there. And of course, he's telling the USAC official that his grandmother could go faster than that. And so uh, and, they, and the official didn't like that. No, he wants to go fast right away. And, you know? uh, yeah. He goes into turn three and waves at him and loses control and starts spinning. And it had rained uh, a day or so before, and it was starting to kick up mud and everything. And the, back then, they taught the drivers, if you think you're going to hit the wall, go well down in the cockpit, you're safer that way. They call it down in the basement. Yeah. And uh, so Sax was doing that. And John Conkle, the uh, funeral home director in Speedway, was driving the ambulance that day. And Eddie called him Elknock, which is Conkle spelled backwards. So, so Conkle goes out there and he drives around, gets to turn three and sees Sack's car park. They're all covered with mud and Eddie's still down there expecting to hit the wall. And so John goes, uh, are you okay? And he says, jolts into reality, he says, uh, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Conkle said, for Christ's sakes, Eddie, take your goggles off. They're, they're full of mud. So Eddie flunks his rookie's test because of that. And uh, they needle the hell out of him, too. Uh, uh, they say uh, that he's going to have to go wash the car to get all the mud off it so his replacement driver won't have to go out <laughs> with it. So, and, but he loved Indy so much. Yeah that he stayed and worked in the cafeteria uh, just so he could be around it. And then he also uh, did this thing of washing cars and he was trying to hide from Clarence Cagle and he would go out and he had several people working for him and he'd go get the car, they'd wash the car and then he'd drive it back and he'd pay them just like a nickel or so yeah. for what he did. Yet everyone thought Eddie was the one washing the car, so they were tossed him a buck or something like that. So he flunked that year. He comes back in 1954 with Milt Marion's car, which was even worse than uh, uh, Doc Morris's car, and he couldn't complete the test then. But he did that year get tied in with Mary Holman in the HOW special, and he finished his second the Pat O'Connor for the championship. Actually, he had the championship won, and O'Connor set fast time and uh, won the heat and won the race. And Sachs, I finished like mid, you know, six, seven days, and it cost him the championship. And then, and uh, but back then they had uh, a points thing for certain tracks that paid. There was like four tracks that paid a point fund. 
and Sachs was the the winner of that. He was going to get an award at Dayton that that particular October. So he was going around telling everyone. Actually, he won more money because of this than Pat O'Connor. So this leads up to what is known as the banquet at Dayton. Oh yes, and, I heard about and, this. Yes. Uh, so Sachs was all excited that he was going to get a trophy and he was going to write a speech and he goes in to Mary Ann's, uh, which was a place where they could grab sandwiches and Dwayne Carter and Bob Swiker and Jerry Hoyt were there. And Eddie wanted to read the speech and he said, no, Eddie, we need to, you know, you're the expert, you're the best talker, we need some reform. And this was the AAA back then, which was iron fisted so they, they were in the place yeah so they said you know you need to go up there and uh, list these demands that we want why all the aa officials are there and uh, so he said, let us buy you lunch and let's talk about it so they <laughs> told him what to write and he said now go home and do it and, and then i think a swiper says just don't walk up the podium barge up to the podium. <laughs> so so when it was time for him to go up there, he goes up and immediately pushes, I think it was Sid Collins or something like that, aside and starts listing the demands that he wants. And and then you could tell the AAA people were really furious on that. And Swiker and Carter and Hoyt, they could tell that they they didn't want to be associated with that troublemaker. So... They left Eddie hanging on the limb, and he got suspended for life. Fortunate for him, because uh, Wilbur hated him anyway, yeah. uh, that a couple of weeks later, Wilbur gets killed in a plane crash. Or, uh, and pretty soon, uh, AAA is, is yeah, gone. Yeah. USAC is formed. Mm-hmm. And but Tony Holman liked, uh, liked Eddie. He, he thought he was a bit of a goofball, but he was sincere. Right. So, yeah. uh, it wasn't trying to butter up only because... Now, Sachs knew that, but I mm-hmm. and I think Sachs felt if he could marry Mary Holman, he would own the Speedway. But but he did it in a sincere way, and and Tony Holman was smart enough to know that. And Mary uh, liked him, and he did well in that only year in the Sprint car. And I think she was a little annoyed at Wilbur that uh, he was making it so hard on him, and that some. Someone once said, you know, it was probably a good thing that happened what happened. Not in that sense, but push would have came to shove and Tony Holman and Mary Holman would have won and Wilbur would not have, and they would have reinstated right. Sachs. Well, Sachs was good on, in a sprint car on the high banks, and that, that meant that, that you really gained a lot of respect mm-hmm. uh, from the car owners and that. And, and so, yeah, he, you know, he was a bit of a, a you know, you know, he had high jinks and talked funny and, and, you know, got the people and got the fans going that, but they, they started to see, hey, this guy can mm-hmm. actually drive. Uh, and then he starts to uh, make some success with, uh, with, with the Peter Schmidt car. Yeah, he, that was the, he uh, also did not make the race in 55. I can't go into this because this is a uh, family channel and why he, he got banned. I'll tell you off camera what happened there, Steve, but, uh, uh, so in 56, he came there in the Ray Brady car mm-hmm. and couldn't make it. And that was a, but this is kind of funny too. Sacks late on the afternoon, the rain was imminent. He goes out to qualify and fills the field. But then he basically stops on the back stretch waiting for the rain to come. Uh, and it almost worked. Uh, but he was the 34th alternate that year. Mm-hmm. But then the next year, after he finished 54, 55, and 56 as runner-up in the sprint car circuit, and you had to be, you really had to be good to do well in sprint cars in those days, particularly with the high bank. He gets the chance in the uh, Pete Smith car, the one that Johnny Thompson had ran so well with the year before and who left to go to the DA lubricant car. So Sachs, as a rookie, qualifies in the middle of the front row and just within a very close, almost beat Pat O'Connor rap for the, uh, for the pole in 57. And, of course, uh, Sachs was 
owned a bar in Center Valley, Pennsylvania by then. And he was telling all the patrons that when he wins Rookie of the Year, we're all going to be able to eat uh, some outstanding lunch meats uh, all year long. Oh, because Stark, Stark Wetzel, Wetzel uh, uh, gave yeah. that. And Eddie ran well in the race for the first 100 miles or so and then dropped out. Uh, in the top 10 were Don Edmonds was just a field filler and never just kept moving backwards and spun out in the race and finished a couple of spots ahead of them. They gave it to Don Edmonds as rookie of the year, which some people say is probably the weakest rookie of the year ever ever mm -hmm. won. But it was a, definitely an anti sax vote. Uh, a lot of the press liked him, a lot of the press didn't like his antics. Yeah. As Peter Schmidt, he gets a couple of front row starts there and then moves into the Dan, Dean Van Lines car, gets the, uh, the pole mm -hmm. in 1661. And uh, 60, I think it is, a six for the 60 race, uh, the CBS documentary. Yes, is, it's uh, on, it's on the pole. On the pole. Yeah. And if you get a chance, it's, it's avail it's, it is available on YouTube. Highly rec uh, recommend it because it certainly gives us a... Uh, an insider's look at Eddie. I think it's one of the best documentaries out there, not only on Eddie, of course, but also on uh, uh, you know how it was to be a race a USAC IndyCar driver back in the early oh, 60s. Oh, it's very well done. Yeah. And Robert Drew, who uh, did the documentary on Hubert Humphrey in the Wisconsin primary in mm -hmm. 1960, uh, shot it. Uh, and it was so well received. It was done in black and white. It was a half-hour show. But they did it again next year when Sachs won the pool again. It was an hour show, and it was in color. They used some of the black and white, but uh, so two years in a row, they had a documentary on television. And then we were talking just before we went on the air here about uh, do, you know some of the other stuff he did. But uh, he also, of course, ran uh, USAC stock cars for Bill Trainer and Zico Lubade for Miss Vanderhurst for that team winning at Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. But he also drove hydroplanes too, didn't he? Yes, he tried anyway. Yeah. And uh, uh, his first one was at Milwaukee in, ninth, not Milwaukee, Madison in 1963. Madison, Indiana. And he was driving the, uh, it was a two engine, it was only two engine hydroplane out there. And in a heat race, uh, it just didn't run well, but he got more publicity for missing, advancing in the heat than uh, I think Bill Muncy who won the the feature that day, and then he was going to run in Idaho uh, for Kirtley, or however they pronounce that, for the Diamond Cup, and uh, he breaks the jaw at Trenton when Bob Winnie, who was a rookie then, spins in front of him, and so there's this story where he's in the hospital, and uh, he was telling his car owner, the boat owner, that maybe this is a good thing happened because to go out there and you know, his wife Nancy was going to want a diamond because it was a diamond thing. And, and then Eddie goes on to joke and, and women like the, a diamond that is where worn is proportionally the equates to the anatomy of the person giving it to her. And Sachs says, it would have cost me a fortune to buy that diamond. And they ran and they laughed at, it, at everything. But he also said something right prophetically. He says, uh, this is the third time now that a rookie has spun in front of me and caused me to get hurt. Ooh. And uh, the owner goes, well, you know, things come in three. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Right. So, and then prophetically, Dave right. McDonald, as a rookie, spins in front of him at the start of the 1964 500 because of that huge fire that uh, both of them lost their lives in. Now, you did. You wrote a book in Eddie Sachs. Mm -hmm. uh, how long ago was that now? That came out in 2005. Okay. It's, uh, I've been told one of the best-selling racing type of books. Uh, the Clown Prince of Racing. Clown Prince of Racing. Not to be confused with the Dick Summers book, Eddie Called Me Boss, which no, Eddie, is awesome. No, that Eddie Called Me Boss by Dick Summers yeah. is the autobiography of Dick Summers. Yeah. He even has a picture of Eddie on the cover. Uh, and this is called Eddie Sachs, The Clown Prince of Racing. And it's in the bright yellow. It matches the colors of almost the 63 
Brian Heaney in cooling car. Now, when he, uh, the, the bright or, uh, red helmet he had, the fluorescent, mm -hmm. was that for hydroplane racing? No, oh. he had that painted for a okay. 61 race that he finished the second. Okay, just the, the so, I think he liked that color yeah. and everything. In 63, the, the paint job was correspond right. with the paint the beautiful. Job. Well, and then in 64, he had a white helmet with a red dot on the top yeah. because he was driving American Red Ball, mm. especially. Did you hear, Steve, that uh, uh, Red Ball would claim they gave red carpet service and whenever they would move people eddie wound up owning a highly successful uh, moving business in detroit which he called speedway van lines which was really american red ball and they would take this red carpet and put it up the steps to imply that all their customers are getting red carpet treaties so when he was able to go to the local uh, Herculon uh, carpet dealer in Indianapolis and tell them that he wanted some of their red carpet that he wanted to put in Victory Lane so when he pulled into Victory Lane it would be there and he also wanted it for his garage and uh, well if you look in the uh, I'll both flash it up on the screen here in his qualifying photo in 64 it is on a red square yep, carpet and, and they had a piece too and they almost didn't get done yeah. Because uh, Saks crashes the day before, and uh, they didn't think they'd have the car ready, and they finally got it ready, and uh, he pulls out late in the day and qualifies it without even one warm-up on it. And then uh, Elmer Ostermeyer and Andy Bates, the couple realize, oh my God, we don't have that, so they run back to uh, Gasoline Alley and get that and spread it out just in time to finish the run. Without getting Clarence Cagle's permission or whatever. <laughs> uh, so, so Sachs pulls in on the red carpet. And uh, you also have a podcast along with uh, Paul Page, of course, the voice of the 500 for many years after Sid Collins and Bob Gates, who's written uh, uh, some excellent books on Bill Vukovic and Jim Herbie's. You guys are doing a podcast. How can they uh, find that? Yes, on it's, uh, it's really been well received. We, we've shot three episodes now. Uh, if you go to YouTube and type in Indy 500 Yesteryear and Today, it will pop up. Uh, or you can go, and if you have a question, you can go to speedwayinsiders at gmail.com and ask a question or uh, want to hear about a famous, favorite race car driver. Our question of the week is, what was your favorite Indy and why? So we'll see what kind of... And we'll try to read a couple of them on the air. And it's kind of the joke I have is, you know, with the three tenors, there was Luciano Pavarotti and Placido Domingo. And then who was that other guy? This is kind of, there's Paul Page and there's Bob Gates. And who's that other that guy? That other guy. So I'm that other guy on that. Very good. Well, Denny, we certainly appreciate ah, it. I appreciate you coming the, on the show and we'll have you on again. Uh and only if we have bratwurst and beer yes. at Milwaukee sometime. Hopefully Denny might be coming up. We'll, we'll have to see. We'll keep you posted. If Denny and if I do, I'd love to meet all the fans. And okay. uh, and the people who just want to talk racing, if they go to uh, speedwayinsiders at gmail.com, and I'll try to answer those texts that you have. Love talking racing. Just like it's fun with you. Uh, people passionate about Indy. You know, it never gets it never gets old and exciting. Is. Certainly so, true. So, but if you don't like it, don't put the thumbs down. You know, <laughs> stay the hell off of it. But we welcome uh, the thumbs up, and the people want to subscribe. So uh, it's going to be a great race. And uh, so, so you've been listening to the Traction Reaction podcast. I'm Steve Zotke, along with Denny uh, Miller. Thank you for listening, and we'll get you next time. Thank you. Bye.